Amen. We are in 2 Kings chapter 7. We are just in the first two verses and we are in our third week. But there's so much to say. And the first thought that I brought to you in this short series, the God of the turnaround, is the there is a word for your situation. That's the first point that I shared with you. There is a word for your situation. doesn't matter what your situation is. There is a word for your situation. Number two, I said, believe the word you receive in your situation. It's not enough to know that there is a word for our, for our situation. It's not enough to hear the word. We've got to believe that word that we receive. You know, the king's officer doubted. He disbelieved the word of God. He doubted the power of God. He doubted the creativity of God. And thirdly, he doubted the messenger of God. And if you doubt these three, you are finished. You have no reason to any longer claim to be a believer or a professor of the Christian faith. Because, you know, the very core of our Christian belief is that we believe God. Amen? We believe God. That's, that's, that's the whole deal. We believe his word. We believe his power. We believe the creativity of God. Glory to God. We believe the messengers that God sends our way. We don't look at people who stand, you know, behind uh, the pulpit as, you know, okay, he's, he's here, he, he's the pastor or he's the evangelist or the visiting. No, we, we look at them as God's messengers, God's conduit, God's channel, you know, to deliver to us the rhema from the logos. God always has a rhema from his logos. From his inexhaustible riches of the Logos, God has a rhema for every one of you every time you set your foot into, you know, the, the presence of God in the house of God, right? Now, it is very important that we understand that we got to break away from the conduct of unbelief. And I shared with you six things last week. I'm not going to go over it, but you just go back and reflect upon it. You know, God has commissioned us not to walk in unbelief because it's dangerous, not to him, but to us. As believers, you know, the heinous sin is unbelief as a believer. That's the worst thing we can have. We need to deal with it. And how do we deal with it? We deal with it by believing the word of God. I want to give you an example from the New Testament, Acts chapter 27. And as you're turning to Acts chapter 27, let me just give you the context. Paul has been told by God that he has to stand before Caesar and witness. He will not die before that. He has to meet Caesar. And on his way, you know, he, he has to go to Rome and, you know, he has to board a ship. And when he was about to board the ship, he sensed that there was danger coming. And he told the captain of the ship and the others, and they, you know, they, they took him very lightly. They said, what, what does this, you know, prisoner know? We are, you know, seafaring men. We know everything about the sea. Uh, and he's trying to tell us what to do. And they just, con you know, ignored what he said. And they went on. And what happened is we all know they ran into a severe storm. And when they ran into the storm, you know, there was a danger to their life, not just to the property, but to their very lives. Now, we don't mind losing property as long as we can gain our life. We don't mind losing a lot of stuff as long as we can live. Because if we live, we can get it back by the grace of God. So these men, when it came to the point that they were about to lose their lives, you lose their lives, they began to fear greatly. And it was at that time that Paul steps in with this glorious confession. Acts chapter 27 and verse 25. He says, therefore take heart. That means, therefore have courage, men, for I believe God. That by itself is enough if we just stop there. Therefore take heart. Have courage, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. Powerful. He says, I believe God. Everybody lift your voice and say, I believe God. I mean, the way you say it, you must make the devil nervous. You know, that's, that, that's how it should come out from you. It should come out, you know, from your innermost being that has been activated, that has been quickened, that has been made alive by the spirit dwelling in your spirit. You got to say, I believe God. Oh, hallelujah. That, I'm telling you, if I don't say anything more, if I just take my seat right now, you can go home and tell the devil, now it's all over because I believe 
God. That's the power. That's the power of that statement. He says, I know everything is going, you know, crazy, but I believe God. Because it will happen just as it was told me. What was told to him? Verse 23. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Let me tell you something. And I want you to write this down. When your situation seems out of control, let your convictions control your conclusions. Good God Almighty. Oh God. To grapple with that truth took me days to digest that very statement. When your situation seems out of control, let your convictions, convictions here means your strong belief, your firm belief. That's the word. That's the meaning of the word conviction here. Let your convictions, your strong, your firm belief, control your conclusions. It is your convictions about God that will help you navigate and manage the difficulties that come your way. It is your convictions, your strong belief, your firm belief about God that will help you navigate and manage the difficulties that come your way. Paul says, I know what you all think. I know what you all feel. But I believe God. Oh, hallelujah. If that will become your, you know, take away this morning, I've done my, I've done my assignment. I don't care what goes on, but I believe God. I believe in the one who is the personification of truth. I believe God. That's his conviction. I see the storm. I see the water coming into the ship. But an angel of God stood next to me and told me, my life isn't ending this way. <clears throat> my life isn't ending this way. This way. Yes, I see the storm. But I believe God. I want everybody to lift your voice and say one more time. I believe God. Amen. Do you believe God? No matter what you go through, do you believe God? Hallelujah. Right in the middle of your hell, you must be able to stand up and say, but I believe God. Right in the midst of your fiery furnace, you, you got to be able to stay, I believe God. Right in the place of an overflowing river, you got to put your foot down into it and say, I believe God. Right, you know, walking beside walls of water on either side and you don't know when it will cave in, you got to look at both of them and say, I believe God. When you face mountains that surround you and the devil, you know, encumbering and coming all over you, you got to be able to stand in the middle of that onslaught and say, I, hallelujah, I'm broke, but I believe God. I got messed up, but I believe God. I'm worried about certain things in life, but I believe God. Hallelujah. I believe God. The doctor gave me a bad report, but I believe God. I believe what God said to me. That's why I act like I act. That's why I sound like I sound. That's why I smile like I smile. Because I believe God. My brothers and sisters, may I say to you today, let your convictions control your conclusions. I want to give you two examples from the Old Testament and two examples from the New Testament about people who let their convictions, their strong faith, their firm belief in God control their conclusions. The first one I want to talk about is Abraham. Because you cannot talk about faith and not talk about Abraham. 
because he is the father of faith. Glory to God. Now, look at how, or let's see Abraham's convictions about God in the time of a severe test. Genesis chapter 22, please. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2. God said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on, of which I shall tell you. Now, just put yourself there if you were Abraham. And God showed up to you and said, take your son, your only son, Isaac. He mentions the name because he knew that, you know, Abraham did not have only one son. He had another son, Ishmael. But as far as God's concerned, there was only one son, the son of promise. And that's all he considered while he spoke to Abraham. That's why he says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. That, that has got to shatter anybody's resolve and emotion, no matter how great a person of faith you are. You are not going to sacrifice your child. Not the dream child that you have. Not the supernatural child that you have because he's, his birth was supernatural. You're right? His birth was supernatural. I mean, Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90 when this boy was born. And when he was born, they named him laughter because both of them laughed at God's, you know, verdict. Be careful who you laugh at because he will end up making you laugh for the rest of your life. Mm -mm. You got to know who gives you the promise. It does not matter what the world says, what my IQ says. You know, it does not matter after that once God gives me a word. If he gives me a promise, that settles it, my friend. But this God, comes and tells him, take your son and offer him as a burnt offering. And the Bible says, it was not only a test of his faith, but it was also a test of his obedience. How much do you trust God is revealed in your level of obedience to God. Let me say that again. How much you trust God is seen in the level of your obedience to God. The greater your obedience, the greater the level of your faith. God wants us to come to that place where we are sold out to him. Ready to give up anything and everything he will place his finger on. Because I believe God. He took up everything that is needed for the sacrifice, took his boy and they started to go. Let me tell you, that was the three hardest and the three longest days of Abraham's life. From his house to Mount Moriah, took three days travel. I tell you, those three days was like eons, ages to Abraham. And I can imagine the, the thousands of thoughts and questions that ran in his mind. God, did you really speak this? God, am I sure about this? God, did you tell me this? I, I think I'm acting, I, I'm acting up very emotionally. God, is this from me? I mean, a lot of questions are bombarding him. And now and again, I believe he must have taken a look at Isaac with pain in his heart. Let's be real, people. He didn't just walk up and take that knife and lift. No, no, no. He had to battle the devil and all his emotions. He had to battle it along the way. That's why God gave him those three days to deal with his thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then, right out of the blue, Isaac shoots him a question that pierces him to the core of his heart. In verse 7, the second part of that verse, Isaac said, Father, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? What would you do if you were the father and was asked that question? You would have turned and said, son, you are the lamb for the sacrifice. I mean, that's all we would have said. Abraham had to say that, but in a flash of lightning, something so profound, welled up on the inside of him and came out of his mouth even without his thinking. Let me tell you, my friend, when you step out in faith, God's going to put the word inside of you that even before you think, it will come out of you and you'll wonder, did I say that? That's the kind of God you serve. He gives you everything you need for a trip 
of trial. For a journey of testing. Good God. You can face the test if you got God on your side. He said, and I love this. And Abraham said, my son, God. <laughs> Good God. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. He didn't say God will provide a lamb. He said God will provide. Oh my, my. He said God will provide the lamb looking all the way past, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of years down to a place called Golgotha on the same Mount Moriah. The range of mountains called Moriah. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two men went together. How did this man come up with that conviction about God? God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. How did he come up with that? Keep your finger in Genesis. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, please. The author of the book of Hebrews gives an explanation of the same incident. Here we have the description in Genesis 22. And we have the explanation of the definition in Hebrews. You must understand the Old Testament is descriptive. The New Testament is definitive. And in Hebrews chapter 11, the author says, verse 17 onwards, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. Of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Settled. There's the promise. In Isaac, your seed shall be called. Now look at verse 19. Concluding, your convictions should control your conclusions. So Abraham concludes that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What was his conclusion? God is able to raise up Isaac even from the dead. Good God Almighty. How did he come to that level of conviction? How did he come to that level of strong faith and firm belief in God? Because he got a promise. There is a word for your situation. Slip over again to Genesis, please. Chapter 17, verse 19. That's why I said keep your finger in the book of Genesis. Genesis 17, 19 is God's promise to Abraham. Then God said, no, Sarah your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. God says, no, Ishmael is not going to be the one. Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after them. You see, God has promised that Isaac will live and have children or have descendants. But at that point in Isaac's life, he wasn't even married. When Abraham took him up to offer him as a burnt sacrifice, Isaac wasn't married yet. But God had promised before the boy arrived about Isaac and his descendants. Talk to me, somebody. Oh, come on. Abraham is to have faith in this promise that Isaac will have children. He had to believe that promise that Isaac will have children. God already promised Abraham. That Isaac would have children. And through him would come the Messiah. God had already promised Abraham that. That Isaac will live 
he will have descendants and through him oh yeah would come the messiah now he's being tested in his faith to see if it will follow through with something which seems totally contradictory to that taking isaac's life what will you do when god sometimes seems to contradict himself because in genesis 17 he says i have made an everlasting covenant with isaac and his descendants and then in chapter 22 god comes and says kill him what would you do when god right before you contradicts himself how would you handle your convictions then it's easy to handle your convictions if if it is a and a all the time if it's yeah and amen all the time it won't be a problem when god says you know this boy is going to have sons and through him i'm going to you know bless your seed and through him the messiah is going to come now now he comes and he says to him offer him as a burnt sacrifice which do i believe the promise you gave me or the act you're asking me to commit mm, good god almighty and abraham's conclusion was this he allowed his conviction his faith his firm faith the strong faith to control his conclusions he said if god has spoken listen to me very carefully now if god has spoken then what i have been asked to do cannot stop what has already been promised good god almighty oh you got to wake up and catch this this morning we're going a little deep today listen church you got to understand abraham saying if god has spoken then what i have been asked to do it is kill my son and burn him up cannot stop what god already promised before oh come on talk to me somebody it does not matter if it looks contradictory but if god said it that isaac and his seed will live then i don't mind killing my son because let me tell you this abraham said i have come to the conclusion that my god is able 